Welcome everybody. My name is Martha Creek. You can contact me, marthacreek.com, if there's any way in the world that I can support you. I was very called, as many of you know, that's been on these last few weeks to hear. I was directed to lead a, a group for healing relative to uh, experiences of grief, losses, change of any flavor, known and unknown, seen and unseen, conscious and unconscious, and to invite if anybody that could get in here to do it. Then I reached out to people that I knew of and that was recommended to me by others that have, have direct experience, extensive direct experience with grief, grief processes, and the wholeheartedness of the human and including grief in that, and specifically effective ways to be with grief, and to process grief, and moving through it, with it, uh, integrating around it, and getting uh, into um, some relief and some easier space with it. And we've had fantastic speakers these last few weeks, and they've brought forward their uh, experience, their books, and all of that, and it's all on recording. So if you're new tonight and you don't have those recordings, you're welcome to contact me, marthacreek at gmail.com, and I'll provide the recordings for you, which has all the resources that were offered, the books, the book titles, the links to that, and various other resources that organizations that have been identified are providing to be supportive to people in grieving processes and loss and integrating that and incorporating that into their being and into their life. So I'm extremely honored tonight. This is being recorded. And if you want tonight's session, you would also email me marthacreek at gmail.com. And that's the only way I have, even though it's awkward because I didn't require a registration or any payment or anything for this. So that that's the way to get the recording. John Welshen was recommended to me by Reverend Elizabeth Mara, and he is our guest tonight. And he has been gracious and generous and present even on all the email exchanges that it took to get this set up and get this established. And was a very quick yes to get in here and to get in here to this room with us to provide any support that he can be that he can bring into this healing, the heart of humanity and healing processes around grief. So there's a lot about John Welshens <laughs> um, and I'm not gonna spend the time talking about that because I don't believe that he would want that either. And if John, if you do want that, please weigh in and share that. And I have put his website up there, the one soul, one love.com website. So you can know about him and read about him. His book is entitled Awakening from Grief, and I've put a link to get that book and highly, highly recommend that um, for all of us, frankly, for all of us. So as we get into tonight's service, I'm going to ask John some questions based on what I've been hearing from some of the folks in the group and based on what I have been experiencing with people particularly in this more immediate time and these time of rapid changes and what seems like an intensity around some of the grief that we're in in this protracted time of grief. And what I personally have witnessed from some of the strongest, most highly effective, highly practiced, highly devoted, capable people I've ever met and how grief has influencing them currently. So that that is a part of what we will be addressing here tonight. And then if you have a specific question, put it in the chat if you can. And um, I'll get to them as, as, we, as this unfolds here. So John, a deep bow to you and a sincere thank you for taking your time to be here with us tonight and sharing of your heart with us um, in the direction of healing. Well, thank you, Martha. It's incredibly wonderful to be with all of you and uh, so wonderful of you to put this all together. So um, there's really not much need for an introduction. I can just say briefly 
that my uh, beginnings of working with grief and loss and dying uh, came early in my life when I nearly died of polio. I had one of the last cases of polio when I was three years old. And I think the, um, the most powerful effect of that on my life was to let me know that children can die. And I didn't, and that was miraculous. And also something that really made me aware that I needed to, to do something meaningful with my life. There were a lot of ups and downs and warps and woofs in life and uh, several years of recovering from polio. And then um, when I was 11, my parents both became very serious alcoholics and that creates a whole different kind of grief than what we generally associate with death. And my mother died when I was 18. And um, four years later, I met Ramdas, great spiritual teacher who suggested when I first met him, well, he had said in his lecture, not the day that I met him, um, that he had been working a lot with people who were dying and he was finding it to be the highest spiritual practice he had ever come upon. And although I had sat at my mother's bedside when she was dying, I had kind of set that aside because our culture doesn't really know how to talk about these things still, you know, 50 years later, more than 50 years later. And, um, but Ramdas had recently met Elizabeth Kubler Ross, and he suggested that I go study with her. So I did that a couple of years later. And at the same workshop that I attended, uh, Stephen Levine was present. And um, he was meeting Elizabeth for the first time. Those of you don't, who don't know, Stephen was a wonderful Buddhist meditation teacher who uh, Elizabeth invited immediately to teach at her uh, dying retreats. And they just hit it off like amazingly. And, um, but she said to him, you know, you can't just teach meditation. You have to understand who it is you're teaching. And um, he became one of the most gifted counselors I've ever known. And, um, I worked with him and his wife, Andrea, for a number of years in the 1980s. So um, those are the major ingredients. And um, you kindly mentioned my book, Martha, and here it is, it's called Awakening from Grief. And some of you, I wonder, may have read uh, Stephen Levine's book, Who Dies? And uh, I, I used to see it as my Bible. And um, whenever anyone would ask me what one book they should read, I would say Who Dies by Stephen Levine. And then I found that people who didn't have some background in Eastern thought had a hard time with the book. So I said to Stephen and Andrea, maybe I'll write a book that's sort of a who dies for a larger group of people. And uh, they put their blessing on that. So that was how Awakening from Grief came about. It was originally published in 2000. And uh, it's actually, I have two other books. Um, the next one was When Prayers Aren't Answered, Opening the Heart and Quieting the Mind in Challenging Times. And then the third one is uh, One Soul, One Love, One Heart the sacred path to healing all relationships. Now, this one came about because I was spending a lot of time with Harville Hendricks, who was a wonderful relationship guru. And uh, he said to me, you know, you really should write about relationships. I said, I should. He said, yes, relationships are full of grief. So you just need to adapt the material in that direction. So I uh, wound up with a book about grief, unanswered prayer, and relationships. <laughs> and uh, so that's basically it. 
Mm -hmm. And thank you for that and all that you've done and all that you've lived through, John, to make writing about that possible and not just from a theoretical or conceptual perspective, but from um, the wisdom of a heart that knows it firsthand. So one of the questions tonight is, um, and you mentioned it, that this tendency to avoid grief in a society that's grief avoided. That's what one of our first speakers opened her session with the grief avoidance in the society. So then what is some specific ways that we, I, and anybody listening here, what, are, what could you tell us? What could you say to us from this experience that you have about the consequences of that and how we cannot do that? So advise us, coach us about not avoiding grief and, and even encourage us about it. So would you speak about that first? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I got immediately when I first studied with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and that was in 1976, was that it was part of a conference attended by 2,000 people. 1976, we barely knew the word hospice in those days. It wasn't part of our lexicon in the culture. There were no hospices. Uh, there were in England, but, um, but Elizabeth is speaking at this conference with 2000 attendees about the thing that nobody's supposed to talk about, which is death and grief. And the first thing I noticed was that by midday on the second day of the conference, everybody seemed happy. And I thought, you know, this is very peculiar. Here we are talking about the thing we're not supposed to talk about, and there's a lot of joy here. And what it felt like to me, Martha, was that a great weight had been lifted off people's shoulders, just being able to speak about it. You know, I remember as a child, if you brought up the subject of death, like at the dinner table, it was really a no-no, you know, I mean, don't mention that here, it's, you know, in bad taste. And I got the message that death must be something that's so bad, even the big people won't talk about it. So... Then we started to look, thank you, thanks to <clears throat> Ram Dass and some of Elizabeth's work and Stephen Levine's work, we looked at other cultures where we realized that that was not necessarily the case in other cultures, especially cultures that are more connected to nature than we are, you know, and they just see. Now, I had gone to India, <coughs> excuse me, in 1973. And without getting too deeply into it, you know, death is right out in front of your face in India all the time. And I saw that it was something that was treated much differently. The children weren't hidden away or taught to turn their eyes away or anything. It really was received as part of life. And again, I saw a culture of people in India in 73 who um, had nothing compared to what we have in terms of all of the material things that we think we need to make us happy. And they seem much happier than we did. So that fascinated all of us. The cost of not openly acknowledging and honoring the inevitability of death, our mortality, and working to prepare for the inevitable grief in life is frankly that we don't live fully because we're always pretending we're gonna live forever and that everybody we know and love is gonna live forever. And so when death comes, it's a shock. I mean, it's a shock, but it's like one that we haven't even remotely prepared for most of the time. So, I'll share this, you know, in my work in this field, I finally got something about 30 years ago. And I started to add to my morning meditation. Every morning, I get up and sit in front of my puja, my altar, 
and I would go through my morning meditations. And then I would say to myself, I still do this every day, today could be my last day on earth or the last for someone I love. In light of that, how do I want to spend it? What do I want to fill my mind with? How do I want to treat people? How do I want to spend my time? Do I want to be cranky and upset or do I want to be loving and kind? Do I want to be selfish or do I want to be generous? And, you know, I remember reading the great books by Carlos Castaneda back in the 70s, which were about the teachings of a, a, a Native American wise man named Don Juan. And he used Carlos's death, his inevitable death, as a very powerful teaching. And I remember at one point he says to Carlos in one of the books, whenever you have a moment of uncertainty, he said, keep your death on your left shoulder. It's the wisest advisor you have. And whenever you're uncertain about something, turn to your death and ask, if this is your time. He said, a tremendous amount of pettiness is dropped if your death makes a gesture toward you. And I think that, you know, it's interesting to see culturally things like 9-11, you know, was a time when our culture woke up very dramatically. And the fascinating thing was I live just 12 miles from New York City. And the interesting thing was that in the wake of this horrific event, you know, where a major portion of the New York skyline disappeared through an act of unthinkable violence. And the smoke was pouring out of the World Trade Center site for three months. There were still fires smoldering and burning. So that was like a scene of hell, but all around it for a couple of weeks, the change in the way people treated each other and the way people examined life and engaged with life was so profound. And it was like, you know, people were just being kind and gentle and friendly and this whole, so with this scene of hell, and destruction and death at the center almost of New York City, around that, what appeared to be like heaven. Now it didn't last, it was like a deathbed conversion, you know, it was, uh, but it was beautiful to see. It brought out the best in people. And the reason I felt was because we didn't know what was gonna happen next. And whoever we're with, could be an absolute stranger, that could be the last person we ever see. So, you know, the last thing I'll say is when I started working with Stephen Levine, I remember he asked me to set up a workshop for him in New York City. And I said, what are we going to call it? It's going to be about dying and grief. He said, we're going to call it being fully alive. So unfortunately, a lot of us come into this experience with very little preparation. But ultimately, as we begin to work with it and we start to understand that we're not alone, that every human being on earth has suffering, has loss, has disappointment, has fear, every human being. And it's a part of human life. So if we can use this experience to recognize that we're all in this together, sometimes the most devastating losses in life can become the opportunities for the greatest growth. Yeah. I've heard it many, many times. And my daddy used to say, similar to what you're speaking about, John, he said, Honey, people aren't living 
they're not living because they're so afraid of dying that the fear of death has got such a grip on us that people have stopped living already. So they're already in the grave before we get in the grave. And it's, I remember even as a kid, like having some awareness of what you're describing here tonight. Like, like it's not just theoretical that nothing's promised. It's not just theoretical that this could be the last day. And the day that we talk about could be my last day is actual, that it, it's actual, it could be today. And I've never met somebody that <laughs> regretted being kind, that <laughs> regretted being like their most generous self. So it, it's inspired me to hear this again and some encouragement to not turn away from this grief. So in my preparation for this class, I read something about a study that people were brought together to do grief work and they had people to write about grief for just 15 minutes a day and the others weren't didn't write about it and what happened is what you're describing at that Elizabeth Kubler Ross event after writing about it 15 minutes a day for the two or three days that they were together they were better off they were they were back to life they had some vitality they had regenerated themselves they they had a, a new perspective about life and it's that is so doable to doable to find somebody to speak about this with, to call their names, to call the loved one's names, to, to speak about them, to honor their life or to write about it or to journal or to do art or something. So I, I know and I know and claim that something will be offered here tonight that's gonna bring that kind of healing that we can do by speaking about it, writing about it or something that's gonna move us out of this, any kind of avoidance or pretending or spiritual bypassing or, anything like that, that, that we do. So speak a little bit then John about, um, you know, I've heard as I was, a, well, even recently that this impact of some of the losses that these people that are in my orbit, these strong, capable, practice, devoted, well-read people that's moved through this pretty well over time, that what, the grief they're in now, be it a husband, a, a grown child, and, and, and certainly children, but the people, I'm talking about the people in my immediate right now, are feel like the grief they're in now has shocked them. That they can't, they couldn't believe they could ever have this kind of grief. So one woman said, for example, I have never been hammered by grief like this over the death of my sister who I wasn't even that close to, but her death has laid me out. So it, the, everything I did in the past to kind of navigate these winds has not worked currently or it's not working as effectively. So it sounds woo-wooish or something to talk about a new intensity about this or some kind of bigger energy we're in or something. So just speak to that any way you can generally or otherwise about the grief that shocks us, grief that we can't believe is affecting us the way it is and how our practices and how we've navigated it, grief and loss before are maybe not as effective now. You know, that story, Martha, um brings to mind a few things. First of all, there's an interesting thing that I have witnessed over many decades. And that is that very often a relationship that hasn't reached a sense of fullness and fulfillment, like the one perhaps you're describing of this woman with her sister, um, that is often not always, but often a more difficult grief than the relationships that feel really united in love. Because there's a certain sense of lost opportunity and a sense of incompleteness. And um, so I think that we look at these things, it, grief very often surprises us. You know, I've often been surprised that I feel an intense grief for the loss of one person, 
um, where I feel at peace with the losses of many people. Um, sometimes it has to do with preparation. Sometimes it has to do with age, you know? I mean, the, we all have something in our minds that children aren't supposed to die. I said, you know, at the outset, I, I got the lesson that that isn't necessarily true. And um, the other thing is that the loss of a sibling is very close. You know, it's, it's like it's, parents are different in the sense they're older. Sibling is closer in age to us. And then we have to think, oh my goodness, you know? And so the, the, the double dose kind of is the sense that my sister, perhaps I was never as close to as I would have liked to be. And now she's gone. And I feel like I don't have the opportunity to heal that. And it's reminding me, you know, my days are numbered too. So what I feel is that the first thing we have to do is to try to surrender the idea that people aren't supposed to die or people aren't supposed to die at a certain age. Um, you know, we live sometimes as if it's like when we came out of the womb in the delivery room, someone was standing there with a certificate signed by God that they give to us and said, this is your guarantee of at least 75 years in this body. You know, but nobody gets that. <laughs> Where in any spiritual teaching, in any great spiritual book, does it say anything about human beings being entitled to any length of life? So I always take it to be, the point is, live now, live today. This is it. This moment is all we've got. And, um, you know, because of our tendency to postpone things, we can always say, well, I'll get around to it later. I'll be nice later, you know, I'll be generous later. Right now I have to make money, but you know, later I can be, when I have enough and I feel comfortable, I'll be generous. But that's just one example of how we postpone um, moving into our true spiritual heart. So my recommendation is that when grief comes in a way that is breaking your heart, let it break your heart. Let it break your heart open. Let it break open all of the hardness that has formed in most of us around our heart. And for a time, you just have to allow yourself to be devastated. You just, that's a part of being a human being. You just let it you know, sometimes people say, I, I feel like it's going to flatten me. And I'll say, oh, let it flatten you, you know, and lie flat until you're ready to get up. Let it work its, work, run its course. Let it do its, its teaching. It's perhaps the most powerful teacher we have. Thank you for it. Uh, I know that these words... Um hold such wisdom and and encouragement and uh, we've heard it over and over and over like to surrender to that you know and one of uh, my teacher has said to me like let it kill you if you think it will kill you let it kill you like let it kill off anything that it can kill off so that you can see what is real so that you can experience that as real. So I remember in this, in my mind, this came from those er, that early work that I would start to get study and look at. And I remember the, the Dr. Kubler-Ross's books and what that meant to me. And then some teacher told me once, I said, just tell me, tell me the truth about grief. If I'm going to serve the way I'm here to serve and I'm going to be with people in these intense situations, it's loss and grief and change and 
dead babies and, and, and dead husbands and, and loss of jobs and loss of limb and loss of life and loss of money, then just tell me the truth. And she said, it's simple. She said three things. You won't have to do it alone. Although it feels like you might have to do it alone, that you're alone. You don't have to do it alone. You cannot do it wrong, which absolutely those words freed me. It freed me. So not just that I can't do it wrong and how I'm going to serve them, but that they can't do their grief wrong either. And then the third one was, and it'll take longer than you like. It's going to take longer than you like. So this notion, like you said, when we're born, not only do we think we've got a gift certificate that says, you know, from Santa Claus God that says, oh, 70, guaranteed 75 years, you'll, 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 you're going to live. Not only that, it's like you're going to live healthy, wealthy, and wise for 75 years. You're going to get everything you want in this life. You're not going to have any disappointments, any sadnesses, or anything else. Not only are you going to live to be 75, but everybody you know and love is going to live to be 75. So this mythical, magical, delusional, naive mind that's that's not serving us and I so desperately want to hand something out hand something else out to the next generations so that is not handed down like there's something that's more reality based that is handed down and without spiritualizing it without we're one we're one <laughs> like well in the absolute we're one but back here at the ranch no mother that just put her baby in the ground needs to hear we're all one <laughs> or needs any lessons or any sermons on infinite life or eternity that <laughs> she just needs a big a big hug around her maybe I don't know so speak a little bit about it John about these platitudes about loss and grief and our best attempts as teachers as ministers as mothers, as fathers, as grandmothers and grandfathers of trying to comfort the afflicted, trying to comfort the grieved by throwing these spiritual platitudes on them. And what we what would be more effective, what would be more healing and, and heal us from doing that if you can tonight, like just lay a healing on us so that after tonight, there's not a one of us that's going to turn around and throw out some kind of by, um, a, um, platitude about that when somebody's heart is breaking wide open. Well, I think the thing that you're asking about, Martha, the thing that will heal us all is love. That's what people need when we're grieving and uh, to feel that they're not in it alone. You know, uh, in Awakening from Grief, I told a story, and I've heard many stories like this. This one happened to be from my older sister, who lost her firstborn child. He was 38 when he died, um, but died in a very tragic way. And um, she loved him dearly. And um, it was a complicated situation. That was 25 years ago. And um, I talked to her and interviewed her for Awakening from Grief because at that point it was about um, three or four years past her son's death. And I said, tell me some of the good experiences and, and some of the things that weren't so helpful. And she said, well, basically, you know, and I think I can say this, she's a very, very religious person who dearly loves her minister. She said, I went to my minister and he really wasn't much help at all. I got the sense that he couldn't deal with my, the level of my emotion. And um, she said, someone recommended to me a, psychologist so I went to a psychologist for a while and I didn't feel like he got what I was going through and she said I tried a number of other things she said ultimately what was most helpful was I have two girlfriends who would come over to my house and cry with me and 
you know, the problem is at the other end of the spectrum for people who are going through a loss is that they will say, I don't know what happened to my friends. They've all disappeared when I need them the most. And my sense of that is that basically because we don't talk about this and we don't prepare for it, the people generally aren't staying away because they don't care. They're staying away because they don't know what to say or do. And they're afraid they're gonna say something that'll make things worse. And there's always that thing of like, if you say something that causes a person who's grieving to cry, you've done something terrible. When in fact, it might be the greatest blessing they've ever gotten. So I think rather than think in terms of, I have to say something brilliant and wise, or I have to do something that will solve the problems. You know, the old model was just bring food, (laughs) which in fact was um, really a better gift than platitudes. And to just put your arms around someone and just give them love and say, I'm here, I'm right here with you and not be afraid. And if you are afraid, then you can be afraid together, you know, but um, one of the things Stephen used to say was the reason we have so little room in our hearts for someone else's pain is because we have so little room in our hearts for our own. So I find all of this as, you know, if I'm reminded during the day of our mortality by whatever, you know, the news of something that's happened to a friend or family member, something in the news, uh, newspaper or on TV. Um, I really, at this point, feel grateful. Not that people are suffering, but grateful to be reminded. Yeah, this is the way life is, you know? It's really basic Buddhist thought that Buddha shared in his Four Noble Truths, the cause of life, the cause of suffering is desire. Well, what's the desire? The desire is for things to be different than they are, whatever that is. (laughs) <laughs> and you know one of the things that someone asked me about uh, my book about relationships and I said they said you know can you encapsulate it in one sentence I said the sentence is that our problems in relationships with other human beings are basically because we want them to be different than they are so you know at one level it's just accepting the fact that this is the way things are. And the way things are is that we can't always control everything. And not everybody is gonna live to be 75. Some are gonna live to be 105 and probably eventually longer than that. But, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of mothers who had stillborn babies. They never actually took birth. I've known a lot of parents who had infants die, sudden infant death syndrome. And, you know, it's very interesting because every time I'm invited to do this, I realize I'm talking about things that some people would consider rude. (laughs) I shouldn't be talking about this. You're depressing us. And the truth is the truth. You know, it just is the way it is. There is no certainty in life. There's no guarantee. And um, that can be taken as a reminder to live life fully now. Does that help? It helps. And thank you. And I have similar thoughts that I've been called. I'm too much of a realist for (laughs) certain people. And, you know, and I don't say this anymore, but I said it because I heard it from a teacher and I thought, you know, it sums it up. But I stopped saying it because it felt cold to my heart. It felt like it was too cold hearted. But the saying was that grief is a tantrum. Grief is a result of me wanting somebody alive who's not alive. 
I want them to live longer than they lived. I wanted them to be with me. They're not with me. I wanted me to die before they die. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted. And that's real. That's what reality is. That is realistic. And it's, it did not feel right to, to even equate grief to a tantrum to me. So I, I, I could not speak it. I had to stop saying it. And I did not want to lose the message of that, that it is absolutely us not getting what we wanted. And we cannot help that our heart exploded, blew up, shut down, shocked. We're in shock over this because somebody that we wanted to be alive and thought would be alive and innocently, innocently, albeit naively, thought they're going to live longer than we did or that they're going to live longer than they lived. So I, I've got to, for my own sake and to, and to serve the people that I serve, I've got to stay in touch with reality, which is there is no guarantee of any life for any minute, for anything, for any age or whatever. And in, in, for people, for pets, for jobs, for bodies, for health, or whatever. And as depressing as it is, it is also um, the only solid foundation that I have. It is a solid foundation. So depressing to some maybe, but to some it's a solid foundation. So I'm sincerely grateful to hear references like this and a confirmation of what is the truth and we don't have to like the truth <laughs> and we don't have to love the truth <laughs> and we can shake our fist at the truth and um, the, and it's still the truth. It's it, that we have no guarantee. And if whatever life we're going to live, whatever vitality we have, whatever possibility, whatever potential we have exist in whatever this day is, whatever this day can bring. So, um, Martha, 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 pardon yes. me for interrupting. I really want to hear more about what you mean when you say it is my most solid foundation. To accept life on life's terms and that there's no guarantee for living. There's no guarantee of years. There's no guarantee of health. There's no guarantee of employment. There's no guarantee that um, uh, somebody's going to like me. There's no guarantee of a marriage lasting for, till death do us part. That there's no guarantee that my child will not die before I do. That there's no guarantee that there is a guarantee that every pet I have is going to die. There's no pet that's going to live forever either. So the foundation of reality life on its terms, life as it is, life unfolding as it does. And not to um, close my heart to the life that is, to the life that has, because I'm afraid of loss or I'm afraid of death or I'm worried about how uncomfortable it's going to be when that day comes that I'm already in a chronic state of anxiety over those imagined things, over that desire for what isn't, and over my attachment to what never was. And I can't, I cannot be another way in integrity <laughs> and pretend that something else, I can't pretend this fantasy or this mythological, we're going to live forever, or babies won't die before their parents, or whatever, that I've got a certificate, a secret certificate that I got at birth that says I'm going to make it to 75 in perfect health and wealth and wisdom. So that's no solid ground for me. Did that help, Brenda? Is that what you meant, honey? So big no, it's interesting, uh, Martha, that you use the uh, term strongest foundation um, because everything you described is 
no foundation at all in a sense. You know, it's, it's, it, I'm thinking of Pema Chodron's wonderful book called Comfortable with Uncertainty. You know, it's realizing that there is nothing solid in the physical universe, everything changes. So um, it's, it's an interesting, Ramdas used to call it comfortable standing nowhere. <laughs> There's nowhere to stand. So we become comfortable with that. Yeah, that's, that's really it. I, I'm solid and there's no solid. <laughs> I'm, right. solid. I'm solid and there's no solid, yeah. Thank you for recontextualizing it for me, John. So take a big deep breath, everybody. And be aware of your heart, your own heart. And see if there's a question in your heart or coming into your mind and through your heart, something you could speak here or put in the chat that we could address directly tonight. John is so open here to take questions and to respond from his experience. And certainly if there's any way that I can, you're welcome to that too. So if you have a question that's present, um, email me directly or text it to me if you don't want it in the chat or send it to me privately or just plop it right over there so we all can see it, whatever works. And we'll keep the field open for that. So then, um, John, in, in encouraging us here tonight to, to meet reality as it is and to start to really pay attention it's, it sounds like, you know, an invitation, a heartfelt invitation to awaken, to begin to pay close and close attention to our own life and, and the grace of it, the, 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 the gift of it, and to then our relationships, our surroundings, our, our, the, the preciousness of any moment. So sight, sound, senses, and then encouraging us to stop taking it for granted or to quit putting it off, you know, whatever we're going to be about or whatever we're going to do. So speak to us then in terms of regardless of our grief, regardless of the shape of our heart or the shape of the condition of our heart relative to grief, regardless of the loss of acknowledging that, um, how how to come alive, um, how to get back to life, and to know that if I get in the grave with them, that makes there's two in the grave versus there's one in the grave and not a thing I can do about it. And there's one of us that's not in the grave. So. Well, one of the things that I think is really important and useful is to recognize, and sometimes this is, sounds strange when I first say it, but to recognize that the relationship isn't over. You know, it, I remember when my father died, uh, it was at the time that I was working very closely with Stephen and Andrea, and um, a funny thing happened. I, now it was funny, you know, but uh, you know, shortly after he died, when I read his will, I got kind of angry. <laughs> and um, I called Stephen and he said, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm really angry at my father. And he said, ah, the relationship continues. <laughs> and, you know, I was just with someone else who is just feeling so sad that they can't express things that were never expressed or not fully expressed or, you know, whatever in a relationship, love or disappointment or whatever. And I really like to encourage people to cultivate an ongoing relationship by, you know, in my case, I have, as I said, a puja table, an altar, where I put, uh, if there's someone that I'm grieving, I put their picture on the altar. I might even create a special altar for a very special person. And I treat it like I would treat 
photos of Jesus or statue of Buddha or my guru. You know, I bring flowers and incense and candles and I sit and talk to them. And I talk to them as if they're sitting there right in front of me. And I say all the things that I said, you know, I've grieved over the fact that I never said this or, you know, and the opportunity is lost. So in this context, I'm saying the opportunity isn't lost. And the interesting thing is to do that and then be quiet and see if you hear anything. You know, um, it can be any number of situations or circumstances. If you need forgiveness, ask for forgiveness. If you need to offer forgiveness, see if you can find a way to do that. There's a phrase in um, the Buddhist texts that um, has, we've evolved into an actual forgiveness meditation where you sit and you gaze at the other person. You can do this with a living person too, but you say, if there's anything I ever did or said or failed to do or say, either intentionally or unintentionally, that caused you pain, I ask your forgiveness. And then you just sit with that for a little while. And then if it feels comfortable, you can say, if there's anything you ever did or said or failed to do or say, either intentionally or unintentionally, that has caused me pain, I forgive you. And a lot of our grief is about these elements of relationships that we feel are unresolved and unexpressed. So this is one way of working in that dimension and um, ridding ourselves or, or lightening the burden at least of our own self-judgment and self-recrimination and our ongoing tension about whatever it is that we were not completely happy about with the other person. And to just come into that space of this is the way it is. That was the way it was. And now this is the way it is. And um, you know, I think to, to recognize that even if you know, and I, I really honor what you said at the outset, which was not to over-spiritualize what we're talking about. You could say that um, we're actually talking to the soul of that loved one. But if that's an uncomfortable concept, you could also say that what we're talking to is the part of us that in which they live. You know, it's like it's like our parents live in us as DNA, you know, we have their biological genetic material. They're part of us. And so you can just talk to that part of your own mind and psyche that most of us know we can hear our parents' voices in our heads a lot more than we want to generally, you know. <laughs> uh, I remember the first time when I was probably in my 20s or 30s, and I saw myself gesture in a way that I thought, that's the way my father gestured. And I went, oh my God, do I have to go to an exorcist? What do I do about it? <laughs> but, you know, it's very, very interesting because there's a tenderness in that too. So I, it, I, I refer to it as it's my bones and blood. It's whatever's in my bones and blood and what we don't want to be in our bones and blood too is also sometimes, there. right? Yeah, sometimes yeah. is there. So uh, thank you for the question. So I'll just take these in order and we'll see where we go with them, John. And and if you have to go, it's at, in an, in, in, at, at the time we said to go on and do that. And I customarily have stayed on during this whole month to be with people afterwards. So we sometimes stay on later. So if you're able to do it, you're certainly invited to. And I honor your time. So if you can't do it. 
So speak about John, the request is why moving on or coming back to life or living our life after the death of a loved one feels like betrayal. Hmm. Hmm. That's a big one. That's a big one. Um, you know, one of the things that I would suggest with that is that you could, in the kind of dialogue that I was suggesting in the last segment, you could say to your loved one, would you like me to stay paralyzed like this for the rest of my life? Because I'm willing to do that if that's the best way to honor you. And I find it hard to imagine that any loving person would say, yes, yeah, just stay stuck. <laughs> you know, that would be, that's a very punitive concept, really. And, um, you know, it's interesting to say, well, what would you like me to do? You know, like very interesting thing when we started as a result of Elizabeth's work and Stephen's work and so on, and the ideas of conscious dying and conscious grieving started to emanate out in the culture. Um, one of the effects was that we would talk with someone who was dying about what they wanted for their funeral. But it's very interesting because it, it's kind of bad news for funeral directors because, you know, the person who's dying will generally say something like, for heaven's sake, don't spend a lot of money on a funeral. Have a party. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and um, it's like the whole concept of, you know, spend a long time grief stricken that's going to happen naturally to imprison yourself without any hope of getting through that and coming back to life um, is my guess not something that your loved one would want for you so you could just ask them what they feel you know what loving child would want their parent to stay in hell because they died, you know, they would want somehow to free you. And I think true of a loving spouse, a loving parent, whoever. And that ritual you spoke about, John, of speaking to them directly, or the, the soul of them, or the, the aspect of them that is alive in us, that lived with us, our relationship with them is, is bound to be helpful in this case, honey. So I hope you'll give that a go and try that to free yourself from that. Then a question is, what, what do we actually do, John, with continuous thoughts of the loved one? Just Let me just add one thing to the last question, then we'll, we'll go to that. The, you know, I have a friend named Ken Druck, who's a wonderful psychologist, uh, lives in San Diego. Um, who's done wonderful work in this field. And he lost his 21-year-old daughter in a bus accident in India about 20 years ago. Um, but he calls that tendency to feel that we're betraying loved ones by feeling any joy or moving on in life. He refers to it as the torture chamber. Yeah. There's something that many of us, our minds will do that. So the next question, what to do about constant thoughts? Well, I would say it's a really interesting opportunity to examine what are those thoughts? If the thoughts are constantly, this shouldn't have happened, I wish this had been different, if only, you could look at that also as an aspect of what we just referred to as the torture chamber. So if your thoughts are running in, you know, they're all going down dead end streets, uh, pardon the grotesque metaphor, but it's true. Um, if your thoughts rather are about 
the sweetness and love in the relationship, then take that and start to recognize that whatever your experience is, it's in you. In other words, when we fall in love with someone, they're not feeding into us something we didn't have. They're allowing us to feel the love within us. So because we identify that experience with them, then we start to feel very um, shaky if they die because we're saying, how am I ever gonna feel that again? That feeling is always in you. So try to use your memories and thoughts in a way to awaken that experience of love rather than kind of torturing yourself with the idea that you can't feel that. It's still in you. And I, you know, if a person we love is alive and we think about them, we generally feel joy. Um, I find with, you know, great spiritual beings who most of whom are dead, you know, I think about them and I feel joy. So I try to transfer that to let, let my loved one, let me recognize my loved one as a great spiritual being whose essence lives on so that when I think about them, I can awaken to joy. Thank you. That was so helpful with my baby brother. Like the first thought I had actually when I got the call that he had died. So this was the human being that I loved the most of anybody on the world in the world, my baby brother. And my first thought was, oh, he's free. <laughs> and then whatever followed that. And my, my remembering what was true about him is what got me through that. Like it was, this is my chance to relate to him differently. So I conceptually believed he was a spiritual being alive and he was a little booger, <laughs> a knucklehead. And we had some real gnashing of teeth and I could not, I've never loved another human being like him. And so seeing him, truly seeing him as a spiritual being, not just conceptually as a spiritual being, was was the um, and I don't speak in terms of magic pills, but uh, it, it, the term that was the medicine that was the heart medicine for me. So thank you for speaking it. Let me check in here. There's a couple more questions, John. Do you want to go on and sign off here? Do you want to? No, no. Well, let's go on. <laughs> All right. So this one is about. Um, have you heard? Can you speak about the value of writing letters? and reading the letters out loud in someone's presence. So to have a witness of sorts for the catharsis of that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great tool to use. And um, you then you can do whatever feels comfortable in your own heart with the letter. Just use the letter as an opportunity to pour out your heart, say all the things that you feel you want to say, but feel you can't say because that person is no longer alive. It's the same principle as sitting and talking to them, just doing it in writing, which works more effectively for some people. And sometimes, you know, you can do most anything where you can take that letter and put it as an offering on your um, memorial altar for the person. You can, if it's, if you're pouring out negativity, because of things that you were unhappy about in the relationship or things you're sorry for or whatever. Sometimes it's nice to do that, read it, offer it, and then burn it. You know, put it in a fire and just do that as a release of that negative dark energy. Um, but, but it's a great tool. Writing is a wonderful thing. It's, you know, journaling is a beautiful healing thing for people to do and writing a letter to a loved one who has died. Absolutely. Yeah. So I highly recommend it. And many of you have worked with me. So it's one of the first things you're going to hear from me. If you call me, is like, get, get to writing and, and, and honestly, just to say whatever needs to be said. And John, you've put it so beautifully tonight. Mm -hmm. I've also taken people through intensive exercises, like, like we learned in mystery school, 
to have them to say goodbye to the loved ones in an exercise, not to the loved one, because it could scare them. But for me to say goodbye to my loved ones while they're alive. So I do my goodbyes while they're alive. So I say what needs to be said. And as I did my prayers about tonight's class, it's like if there's going to be a takeaway from tonight, it is my encouragement for you to say what needs to be said, dead or alive, half dead or alive, and write it, speak it, chant it, put it to music, have a witness, don't have a witness, do whatever, but to say what needs to be said and for your own heart's healing. And if you want a witness, I'm certainly available. Susan Ingpool is available on the call. Megan Smith Brooks has made herself available for our speaker last week, Therese Lee, these folks that have got some experience with this. So if you want that, um, there's support here for you. And you know how to find John and track him down. I'm giving you that website. So this last question, John, unless another one comes in, um, is to speak about during COVID, we can't get to the loved ones, they're in the ER, they're in the hospitals, not being able to get in there. And so that's one piece of it. And then when there is what the world calls a medical error, and then there was not communication about the illness or misinformation given it, or anything like that circumstantially to, to, to ease, what, what can you say about that? Well, you know, those are, um, boy, that's a complex issue, but, um, you know, I would say that um, years ago, when we started doing this work, one of the things we were exploring was people who were in coma. And what we found was that it was incredibly helpful to talk to them as if they weren't in a coma, you know, either in their presence or remotely from wherever you are. Or, and you can do it silently. You can just close your eyes and talk to them. And I have known people who've come out of the coma who've said, you know, they felt that. Well, I don't know what that means, but um, I think that, um, again, the really difficult, edgy thing that can get us stuck in our grief is the idea this shouldn't have happened. This is wrong. One of my teachers once said, whenever you hear the words shouldn't or wrong in your mind, you're headed for suffering. Now, again, a complicated issue. Um, when I say that our work is to accept things as they are doesn't necessarily mean leaving them as they are you know it means that they are the way they are now they couldn't possibly be any other way you want to make the world a better place it starts now but it is as it is right now and so you know i think that if we just settle in to the awareness that this is the way things are. We may not like it. May, we may scream and yell and carry on, but ultimately to come back to the realization that this is the way it is and there's nothing we can do about it. That is the beginning of healing, actually. Now, um, I thought it was quite ingenious that at the beginning of COVID, nurses and you know a number of people came up with the idea of talking to your loved ones on an iPad. You know, um, beautiful. I mean, it's the best we could do in that moment. And um, just as an aside, I'll say uh, some of the people on the call tonight have been coming to my. Wednesday night meditation classes on Zoom. And I've been amazed at the power of this medium to unite us. So I always had this idea that, you know, to have a powerful meditation, you had to get a lot of people together in one room. And we have people all over the country 
coming in on Zoom and the meditations are so deep and powerful and we can really feel that connectedness with one another. So, you know, when all else fails, just go into your heart and send love to whoever it is. And don't worry <laughs> if you can quiet your worry down. Don't worry about whether or not they're hearing it. Just know that they will and they'll feel the love. That's the important thing, that they feel the love and the light and the connection from heart to heart. Sometimes I'll recommend visualizing a beacon of light pouring out of your own heart and into the heart of that other person. It doesn't matter how far away they are. It doesn't matter if they've already died. Keep sending love. Keep sending love and light. Thank you for that. And it's like blaming is like should is, I call it, John, a portal to hell. Any should. <laughs> and blaming is a portal to hell, too. As you said, it's there's not a thing I can do about it now. And the, your wise teacher who said, oh, you're still in relationship with that. Like, like, yeah, I am. And it's also a portal to hell. So it's got barbs in me. So, and the mind is programmed to blame. Somebody's got to be to blame for something, to blame, to blame. And it's not going to serve us. And it's not going to serve healing, um, any kind of blaming ourselves or any other person in the world for, for the way of it for the, and for the way things are. So now, you know, I would say that in, in connection with not necessarily leaving things the way they are would be if you've been a an observer of or recipient of truly egregious uh, medical malpractice you know that's something that should be addressed but the problem is that people will often use that as a way to divert around the grief because instead of really grieving the loss, they'll say, this shouldn't have happened, this is wrong, and it's so-and-so's fault, and we're going to get them. And they can spend years in a, in a legal battle, which keeps them occupied and keeps them angry and keeps them, you know, <clears throat> rather than allowing their, themselves to go into their heart and experience the grief. So it's a, it's a two-edged sword. And yeah, um, there's a question about to speak to the grief, the grieving of the death of a relationship. So in my mind, you did by saying, you know, no should is going to change that. So you want to say more about that, honey, like the grieving the death of a relationship? Well, yeah, because that is sometimes, you know, I have many times heard people say to me, uh, if we're talking about a romantic relationship or a divorce, um, many times people have said, I think it would have been easier if this person had died. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an interesting insight into the human mind in a way, because what it's saying is that I the, there's an additional layer of grief, perhaps, because this person voluntarily chose to leave me or I had to choose to leave them I and mean, I didn't want to but they were you know these are the kinds of things that we talk about when we talk about living losses which are losses of marriage loss of relationship loss due to addiction you know having a child or a spouse who's addicted to alcohol or drugs and it just or mentally ill, um, it's like losing someone to Alzheimer's. Um, so in all of those things is the mind often saying, this shouldn't be happening, this is wrong. That's the source of suffering. If, um, if you look at it like this is another event in life that is going to tear my heart open. Let it do its work. And, um, you know, watch out for all the things that can crop up in the loss of a relationship. A lot of guilt, often shame, 
um, that what if, what could I have done differently? Why does it have to be this way? All of those kinds of questions are just kind of feeding the suffering. And what you said at the onset of this class, John, like it's grieving the lost opportunities, grieving the, the fantasy base of what we made up that the relationship was going to be and believing the day that I enter a relationship, I get a certificate mm -hmm. at birth that says this is going to last for the rest of my life. And then to even stand up and take vows, <laughs> which is why people won't have me to do their vows anymore. <laughs> I well, I, you know, I went through a divorce and, um, you know, in a way it was one of the most difficult experiences of my life because I could not let go of the thought that, but I said, till death do us part. And um, ultimately we got through it and um, my former wife and I had ultimately one of the smoothest divorces ever you know and we're good friends now um but yeah yeah learning yeah so there's one mention about um a contact with a loved one who's passed so the longing believing that there is contact possible with a loved one and somebody that's lost their older brother and expecting them to be in presence with them so we want to speak about that. Well, I sort of look at those things like, you know, it, it's, it's risky um, because you never know how it's going to work out. And, and there are examples that cover a range of possibilities. For instance, I have a dear friend who also lost a 21 year old son and um immediately she started hearing him talk to her now you know i have friends who do channeling and so on and and here's this 21 year old guy soul <laughs> probably ancient soul and he says really good stuff to her I mean, you know, I, I used to tell her, you need to publish this. This is very high teaching you're getting from your son. And she once looked at me, not with anger at me, but with anger at God. She said, I want my son back. I don't want some freaking spook talking in my ear. I want my son back. And, you know, it's been very interesting because, you know, when I see her, I'll say, well, are you hearing from your son? And she said, well, you know, he's always available if I want to talk to him, but I want him back. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, that over time has softened. It was important for her to realize that, for it, to acknowledge it. Um, you know, then I have someone else I've been working with recently who said, I don't know why I can't hear my daughter. It turns out that that person is so filled with guilt and shame about her daughter's death that I, I sort of suggested maybe if you could lighten the load of that a bit and forgive yourself, you might hear her. I, I bet she might just talk to you. It's very interesting that what that talking is, is like, Sometimes it's just an intuitive sense. You can just feel it. I, I remember one of the most incredible teachings I had early in life. Um, I would have been 16 when my maternal grandmother died. And um, my mother was telling the story of getting together with her sisters after their mother died. And... Um, they were trying to decide who to give what. My grandmother didn't have much, but she had a few pieces of jewelry that they thought they might like to give to various people. And my mother was sitting in my grandmother's bedroom and talking to my aunt, her sister. And she said, well, I think we should give it to so-and-so. And my mother said, when she said that, she felt like these two hands 
caressing her arms. And it like sort of freaked her out at the moment, but she said, you know, I am certain that was my mother letting me know that was the right thing to do. So I would say just be open. And um, if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't come, you know, in the, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is called the Bardo Tadal, which is all about what happens to souls after we die, it's explained that some just go. They just go into the light. You know, they're just gone back into the source. And others, you know, hang around in various degrees. It doesn't mean they don't love you. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Whatever it is, it is. Thank you for that. All right. I can't, I um, have put a note in there that will stop and I realize we could go on and on and on. So sincere thank you for your life's work, your own devotions and your wisdom here. And um, soliding my ground that's not solid. And on behalf of the group and the people that will hear the recording, John, unspeakable heartfelt thanks for your presence, your heart, your time, and what you've made possible for us tonight. Well, my love and blessings and gratitude to all of you. It's wonderful to be with a group that is so open to sharing about the hardest things in life. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where true spiritual growth happens. And most of us would trade the growth to have our loved one back, but that's not the way it is. Yeah, thank you. One of my friends does a podcast and he says, it's called, let's talk about death and see that it won't kill us. <laughs> <laughs> people ask you what this class is about you can tell them we talked about death and it didn't kill us <laughs> um, and i'm going to if you want to stay on after some of us go off uh, if you want to leave you're welcome to if you want to stay on i'm going to seg segment the group for about 15 minutes in uh, categories so in one group it's going to be people that's had a, a fairly recent loss of a spouse a partner or a relationship that i know of others that have lost a child and another one that's lost uh, this colleague that we've lost in one of the, our unity churches. And your, the invitation that is in that small group for you to get support, to speak about them, to call their name and to learn from the group, how they're coping, how they're dealing and to see if you can resource yourself in a way that's gonna water the plant of your own soul to, to be in life, even in the loss, even in the death to how to get some life back for yourself. So I'll set the groups up. And if you don't wanna go into the group, you just don't accept it. And if you do wanna go into the groups, you hit accept. And then in about 15 minutes, we'll come back to the large group. Thank you, I'm gonna have to go. Blessings right. to you. Blessings all. and love to you all. Thank you too. MarthaCreek.com if I can support you. Blessings. <laughs>